preaching from the next section uh, of Luke's gospel. We started out at Christmas. We've done a few loop the loops, uh, but we found ourselves in chapter four. And I've got two questions for you this morning, and I hope they make you feel a little bit awkward and uncomfortable. Uh, the questions I want to ask this morning, um, when you come to church or when you're part of church, uh, are you meant to be active or passive? Secondly, uh, when you come to church, when you're part of God's church, are you meant to be one who is under authority or one who exercises authority? Now, I'll give you all the answers when we get to the sermon, but I'm hoping um, that we might sit somewhat uneasily with those questions and come up with some nuanced answers as we see Jesus uh, begin his ministry uh, in Luke chapter 4. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. And he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him, and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Is this Joseph's son? they asked. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Do hear in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. I tell you the truth, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet no one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built, in order to throw him down from the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Then... He went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath day began to teach the people. They were amazed at his teaching, because his message had authority. In the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an evil spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Ha! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. All the people were amazed and said to each other, What is this teaching? With authority and power he gives orders to evil spirits, and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. Jesus left the synagogue and went to the town, home of Simon. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. She got up at once and began to wait on them. When the sun was setting, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people, shouting, You are the Son of God! But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew he was the Christ. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, 
And when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. This is the word of the Lord. Well, let me pray. Uh, Father, we ask that you'd help us now to understand your word. We pray that your Holy Spirit would speak clearly to each of us. Amen. When you come to church, are you meant to be active or passive? Now, if you've heard a few ministers preach before, you know this is probably a trick, isn't it? Probably what I'm going to do is try and get you to do more on the roster. I don't just want you to come and sit there. Come on, you've got to do stuff at church. Get going. That's not what I'm going to say. We're going in a different direction today. But what does it mean to be active or passive? Uh, And which of those are you more scared of being? Now, we've got a lot of visitors here this morning, which is nice. Uh, No one's going to feel like they're singled out. But when I'm visiting a church, as I work through the door, uh, my normal hope, for better or worse, is that I'll have a fairly passive experience. Uh, I'm used to being the minister and I'm out the front and I'm active. I'm doing stuff. I'm speaking. I'm doing this. Uh, We were on holidays a few weeks ago. We visited a church and it was lovely to just sit and listen uh, and sing along uh, and pray along. But in a very, I'm in the pew, not out the front kind of way. Uh, I want to give you permission this morning um, that there are times to be active and there are times to be passive. And in fact, in Luke so far, I want you to notice that in the first three chapters of the gospel, Jesus has been decidedly passive. Now, he had a very good excuse to start with. In chapter one, he wasn't born yet. And so he didn't do much. In chapter two, well, he got born. But you don't get a lot of credit for that, do you? And in fact, uh, Jesus was part of the story, but he was a child. He was passive. But then interestingly, in chapter 3, we heard this great preaching, repent Israel, come out and be baptised. But it wasn't Jesus, it was John the Baptist. And what did Jesus do? Well, he came out to be baptised. And after he was baptised, we heard the voice from heaven and Jesus stood and God said, this is my son, I'm pleased with him. And next, what did Jesus do? Well, the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness and Jesus did what he was told. He followed God's plan. He followed the Spirit and he was attacked by the devil uh, who challenged him and tempted him. Uh, And Jesus resisted that temptation. He quoted some scripture, but it was the devil leading the show. And so Jesus, in the first three chapters of the gospel, has been thoroughly passive in a completely wonderful, appropriate helpful way and we've learned that he's God's son well in chapter four we're going to see Jesus move into a much more active phase of his ministry and we see the start of his ministry but I had a second question for you didn't I when do you come to church uh, should you be here to be under authority or should you be exercising authority and authority and power kind of go hand in hand. Uh, now, I hope your obvious answer to that is, well, it's kind of complicated. Uh, and perhaps it's not simply one or the other. As we look at these uh, few stories, and we're going to have to move quickly. I know it's a, a fair chunk we've got. As we look at these few stories, I want us to keep asking the question, who and where is the authority uh, in all of these different moments? Who's active? Who's passive? Uh, who's in authority? Uh, and who is submitting to authority. Now, if you've got the passage open, we're going to uh, roll through it rapidly, but we take it up in verse 14, remembering uh, that in the, the first little bit of four, uh, Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. Uh, and so verse 13, when the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Now, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the spirit and news about him spread through the whole countryside. Uh, And so Jesus was baptised at the Jordan, but now he's heading back up north to Galilee. Now, Galilee's not a town. It's that great big region up the top, a bit more of a rural area uh, where Jesus grew up, where the lake is. Uh, And we're told uh, that he went uh, up there 
and that he's already becoming famous. Now, this is a bit different to the other Gospels. The other Gospel writers um, kind of make a big deal of the start of Jesus' ministry. So John famously talks about the first miracle he did uh, was at the wedding in Cana. Uh, and uh, the other synoptic, uh, Matthew and Mark, talk about uh, how he called the disciples. And Luke will do some of that. But Luke's not so concerned to say exactly where he went out of the wilderness and what the first thing he did was. Now, the first story Luke wants to draw our attention to is when he headed back up to Nazareth. And as we read this story, we'll find out he's already been teaching and doing miracles in other towns. And so in this story, he's already got a bit of a reputation and people are waiting to see what he's made of. Uh, We're told he taught in their synagogues and everyone praised him. Uh, And so far, it sounds like, even though we haven't heard the details, the start of Jesus' ministry is going pretty well. I mean, if you start your ministry and everyone praises you, uh, surely that's a big win. What more could you want? And so he goes to his hometown of Nazareth, where he'd been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. Uh, And a couple of details here. As was his custom probably means, well, Jesus, on Saturdays, that's the Sabbath, He went to the synagogue when he was in Jerusalem. He did it or to the temple Uh, when he was uh, in other places. He always went to the synagogue on Saturday. That's just what he did. It's what he loved. It's where the scriptures were taught and read. This was Jesus bread and butter. He was a good, faithful Jew. Yet, as was his custom, it's also worth noting that now that he's back in Nazareth, he's not just going to the local synagogue. He's going to the local synagogue that he probably grew up in, uh, that he's been to. Uh, for most of his life. And so he would have been very familiar with where everything was, uh, with the people sitting in the front left and the back right, and he would have known how this place works. Uh, And he stood up to read. Uh, And Jesus is back in this synagogue, but Jesus is now a relatively famous teacher. He's got a bit of a reputation. And when a famous rabbi comes to your town, well, you, you get him to get up and speak. And so he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. And I want to pause here. What does it mean he found the place where it was written? Well, seems kind of obvious, but there's two options here. Um, It's possible that this is the passage that was the reading for the day. Uh, And Jesus was told, this is the bit of Isaiah uh, that you need to read. And so he got the scroll out. He found it uh, and he read these words. Now, if that's the case... Uh, It is a profound miracle that God had set things in place perfectly that this was the passage for the day. Alternately, it might well be that Jesus said, I'll have Isaiah, thanks. And they brought the scroll of Isaiah to him. And he unrolled it and he knew where he wanted to go. And he found the spot. And he thought to himself, this is what these people need to hear today. Which would have been a profoundly bold thing for him to do. Either way whether this was in God's providence that this is the passage for the day or whether Jesus chose this passage, this is what he reads. Uh, These words in his home synagogue. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Which is interesting when we've just read about Jesus' baptism uh, where he was anointed by the Holy Spirit from heaven. And now he reads this bold passage from Isaiah. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, which is an interesting thing for someone to say who is a preacher who heals the blind and who has been doing miracles all around the place, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. Uh, And I think this verse we normally profoundly misunderstand uh, because in the synagogue, you would stand to read the scriptures and then you would sit to give the sermon. Uh, So it wasn't that Jesus read this passage and went, I'm done, I'm out, I'm going to sit back down. Uh, Just take that. No, no, he read and then he took the seat as the teacher. And all of the other people in the synagogue would have been sat around as well and they would have waited. What what on earth is he going to say? After reading that, surely some of them would have been putting some connections together and thinking, he he was anointed. Hang on, he's the one who heals. What will he say? And his sermon begins very simply in verse 21. And he began saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. 
Now, I presume he said more than just that, but I think that's his one main point. You know that thing we just read in the Old Testament? Those promises that God's made? It's happening here, now. I am the one um, who God promised. I am the one who is doing all of these things. How is this message going to be received? Well, all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. And again, big tick from your new preacher, everyone likes his words. Everyone's happy with how this is going. They said that that stuff he was talking about, I was like, that was wonderful. I really enjoyed that. I will be back next Saturday uh, for another dose of that. Uh, And the crowds like Jesus. He heals people, he's engaging, he's interesting, and he's making some big, bold claims about himself. And how does it look at this point? Well, it looks like everything's in order. Jesus, God's son, is teaching the word of God. People are lapping it up. He's very popular. What could possibly go wrong? And then they said something else. And it doesn't seem like a terrible thing to say, but this is what people started whispering to each other. Isn't this Joseph's son? And what's so wrong with that? Because after all, he is kind of Joseph's son. We talked about this last week. Uh, He may have not have been, he he wasn't Joseph's biological son, but he was adopted into Joseph's family. Uh, He was raised by Joseph and Mary. He became a carpenter because Joseph, his father, was a carpenter. What's so wrong with everyone saying, isn't this Joseph's son? Well, we know because we read chapters one through three. And in chapter 3 particularly, what was the big theme? Well, the voice from heaven said, hey, everyone, this is my son. And then we read the genealogy uh, where we saw that he tracked all the way back to Adam, the son of God, and that provided us with some confusion. But then he went out into the desert. He was tempted by the devil. And how did he act? Well, he acted like the son of God. He trusted his father. He prayed to his father. You see, we know at this point that this isn't just the son of Joseph. No, no, the reason he teaches like this, the reason he makes this claim is because this is, well, this is the son of God. But the people aren't quite onto it. No, no, isn't this Joseph's son? And the story takes a weird turn here. I think it's partly because Luke, well, he's not giving us every detail, every word that's said. He's moving us through quickly. Uh, But the story continues with Jesus now asking questions, answering the questions, and we don't hear much from the people. All we know that the people are thinking is, what a great guy, enjoyed the sermon, but isn't he just a man? Isn't he just one of us? Well, Jesus said to them, surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. And so as the people say, we think this is just Joseph's son, Jesus says, all right, well, are you going to ask me to do some of the things that you've heard about? Because I've been doing things which speak to me being more than just Joseph's son. I tell you the truth, he continued. No prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was famine throughout the land, yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. Uh, And this is where the story really turns. Uh, Jesus says, look, you don't believe that I'm, I'm the son of God. You think I'm just a man, but let me tell you a couple of stories from the Old Testament. And he draws back to these stories about Elijah and Elisha. Uh, And if you haven't read that part of the Bible lately, some wild stuff happens when Elijah and Elisha are around. And it's one of those moments in the Bible where there are miracles and signs and wonders happening um, in an amazing way. Uh, And this is really important to understand that throughout the scriptures, which are written over hundreds and hundreds of years, miracles don't just happen all the time. They seem to be clustered in these particularly significant moments. There are lots of signs and wonders when God rescues his people out of Egypt. There are lots of signs and wonders around the time of Elijah and Elisha. And then there are lots of miracles and signs and wonders when Jesus turns up on the scene. And so it seems no coincidence that Jesus refers back to the last time when all of these things were going on. Uh, And he says, in the end, 
Who did the signs and wonders work for? A couple of Gentiles. Why? Well, God's people didn't have their eye on the ball. God's people weren't submitting to his authority and trusting them. And as Jesus tells this story, remember that crowd in the synagogue. Love your preaching, Jesus. Very interesting. Nice work. Uh, I'd like to hear more next week. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of town and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. Well, that escalated quickly, didn't it? it? It's a bit of a turn from what a lovely sermon to come with us, we're going to throw you off a cliff. And picture what was going on in that sermon because, sorry, in that synagogue. It looked like Jesus was the one with authority. He spoke with authority. He described himself as the one that God had promised. And the people looked as if they were submitting to his authority. They listened to him. They enjoyed listening to him. When he said something they didn't like, that was the end of them submitting to authority. And suddenly they felt like they were the ones with the authority. They decided, we will decide what bit of your message we want to hear. We will decide whether that's a suitable thing to say in our synagogue. We will decide whether you live or die. And so these people who seemed on board suddenly take him away. And I'm reminded of all the people who John called out to be baptised. And what did they say? Yeah, we'll come and be baptised. It's fantastic. And John looked at them and said, you brood of vipers. You see, just because you look like you're on board, just because the signs are good, you're in the right place, in the right building, it doesn't mean your heart is in the right place. And so they're going to throw him off the cliff. And then verse 30 happens, uh, which some people say is a miracle um, and entirely possible that it is. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. A crowd of people want to throw him off a cliff. He walked through them and went on his way. Now, maybe he made himself invisible. Maybe uh, he used his power uh, to evade the crowd. I I wonder, though, I wonder whether the mob uh, dragged him up there. Uh, They all got right at the edge and Jesus said, all right, who's going to do it? Who wants to be the one uh, who casts judgment on me and sends me over? And I can imagine the crowd going, ugh, happy to be part of the crowd, but I don't know if I want to be the one. And suddenly this authority that they had taken upon themselves dissolves away and we see who is really in control. It's the Lord Jesus, of course. Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee. And it's important to note here that Nazareth to Capernaum, that's at least a day's walk. Uh, This story is going to happen on a Sabbath and we just had a Sabbath. uh, So a week has probably passed. Uh, Luke's not just giving us these events in one day. This is happening over a period of time. Uh, But he gets to Capernaum, which is in the region of Galilee, but a bit further away from the lake. uh, And they there were amazed at his teaching. Why? Because his message had authority. And this issue comes up again. His message has authority. People are really impressed, but what are they going to do? Well, in the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an evil spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Ha! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And uh, I'll just say a couple of quick words about demon possession in the scriptures. You might have heard before, some Christians have suggested in the past uh, that demon possession might just be a a weird ye olde way of talking about mental health issues or epilepsy or some physical ailment that's described in a different way in the ancient world. Uh, I think the way that uh, demons are presented in the New Testament uh, doesn't really allow for that possibility. Uh, We're going to read a story about Jesus healing someone in a moment from a physical illness and it is described very differently and over and over we'll be told that Jesus was doing uh, several different things he was preaching he was healing people and he was casting out demons Uh, but a little bit like the fact that I've I've just told you about how in the scriptures there are these pockets uh, of moments when there are healings and then there are uh, whole periods uh, where that's not normal Uh, can anyone think of some cases of demon possession in the Old Testament. 
You know, you might be too embarrassed to say. Now, there is the Saul one where there's an evil spirit and that, that's a bit weird. But the sort of demon possession that happens in the Gospels isn't the norm in the rest of the Scriptures. This isn't something that's happening all the time. The fact that the Son of God comes down from heaven to live among us and some weird spiritual stuff goes on, I think in one sense shouldn't be a big surprise. But as Jesus wanders around um, Israel at this point, uh, he seems to come across people possessed by demons very regularly. Uh, The big difference uh, between when he heals someone of a disease and a demon um, uh, is often that he'll have a conversation with the demon. Uh, When we hear about Simon's mother-in-law being healed, Jesus does speak to the fever and says, get out. Uh, A little bit like when he speaks to the wind and the waves and says, stop it. Uh, A little bit like uh, when his father calls the world into being, let there be light. Uh, God's not afraid to speak to inanimate objects, but they don't speak back. Uh, This evil spirit speaks uh, and it speaks many things that are true. It knows who Jesus is. You are the Holy One of God. In a weird twist, we've seen the people and Jesus with this weird dance about who has authority. Well, the evil spirit doesn't have such confusion. I know you're the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said. Come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. When Jesus speaks to the evil spirit, it submits to his authority like that. Why? He knows who Jesus is. When Jesus speaks to the people, they say, we think this might be the carpenter's son. We better throw him off a cliff. Why? They don't know who he is. They don't understand his authority and so they don't listen. They don't do what he says. They enjoy the preaching, but they don't submit to his authority. Verse 36, all the people were amazed and said to each other, what is this teaching? With authority and power, he gives orders to evil spirits and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. And so we see Jesus now claiming authority, claiming to be the one in whom God's promises will be fulfilled. We see him teaching from the scriptures. We see him casting out demons and healing people. And the big question is, Will people submit to his authority? Not just enjoy his preaching, not come and see the show, but when he says hard things, will they listen? Verse 38, Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. And now Simon's mother-in-law was uh, suffering from a high fever and they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over and rebuked the fever and it left her. She got up at once and began to wait on them. Uh, Now, Simon here is, of course, Simon Peter, uh, one of the disciples and one of Jesus' closest friends. And we learn here that Simon obviously is married or was married. We don't hear a lot about his wife, uh, but he's living there with his mother-in-law and she is healed. Uh, And as I said, Jesus speaks to the fever. The fever doesn't speak back. This is a different category altogether. When the sun was setting, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sicknesses and laying hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, differently, demons came out of many people shouting, you are the son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Christ. Note again, Jesus would not allow them to speak. He is the one with authority and those who know who he is, they are obedient to him. Uh, Also, uh, when they bring people to him at sunset, why are they doing that? Uh, Well, it was the Sabbath. He'd been at the synagogue uh, and the Sabbath finishes at sunset on the Saturday. So as soon as sunset goes, all the people know where he is. They know what he's capable of. They bring uh, everyone to him and he does what he does. He heals. He casts out the demons. Well, at daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him and when they came to where he was, They tried to keep him from leaving them. Now, they're not throwing him off a cliff, so this is a lot better than the first one, isn't it? And yet, where's the authority? Well, Jesus, you're powerful. You do good things. We like your teaching. We think you're a big win for our town. Stay here. 
you're working for us now. We know what's best. We've got a plan for you. Once again, the people, even at their very best, they think they are the ones with authority. They will tell Jesus what to do. And this will be a recurring problem for the disciples, who the more they understand Jesus' plan, the more they think they can guide and shape what Jesus will do. Uh, Peter will famously uh, get accused of acting on behalf of Satan uh, when he tells Jesus that his plan is no good. Where is the authority? Well, the authority must be with Jesus, the eternal Son of God. And when he speaks, well, they need to listen and we need to listen. And so I come back to this question uh, that I asked at the start. Uh, When we come to church, uh, are we coming to be under authority or to be exercising authority? And I don't want there to be any confusion. This isn't an issue about whether the minister has authority or the congregation. This is an issue about whether we have authority or whether he has authority. And it's not just an issue for when we're here in the building on Sunday. It's an issue for all of our lives. Um, Too many times I've had the sad experience of having people join church uh, or youth group. And coming along and saying, I like this. I like what you do here. I'm really into this. But enough already with the telling me how to live. And the telling me what's right and what's wrong. And the making decisions for my life about uh, who I marry and how I don't want to be told what to do. And it fundamentally comes back to this issue of when we come to Jesus, when we come to his church, are we willing to hand over authority to him? to God, to his son, our Lord Jesus, because that will be the expectation. And right here in this passage, we've had a group of people who will turn up to the holy building every week, who will enjoy the preaching, who will be friends with the other people there, but they're not prepared to listen to Jesus, especially when he starts telling them what to do. But here's the thing about being a Christian. The first thing you need to do in being a Christian is to be passive. Is to say, God, you're the one who's in control. You're the one who's done everything required that I might be saved. Uh, I'm reminded of the story of Mary and Martha. Uh, Getting busy is good. But when Jesus is in the room, uh, you need to get down and you need to listen to him. Uh, You need to be prepared to be changed and shaped by his words. Now, one of the wonderful things about the gospel is that once you have sat at Jesus' feet, once you have been forgiven of your sins, uh, once you have passively accepted all that he's done, well, he's actually the kind of God, uh, the kind of saviour, the kind of king who says, now I want to give you some responsibility. Uh, Now I want you to be active. Uh, Now I want you to get up and do some things and and love some people and uh, speak some powerful words from the scriptures and and talk about Jesus because God does want us to be active uh, and involved. Uh, He gives us authority. And yet, first we've got to give it up. Uh, Whose example should we follow in this story? Well, obviously Jesus, he's very good. Uh, But I wonder whether we're meant to take a leaf out of the demon's book as well. Don't say that in church too often. (laughs) They know who he is and so they listen to him. There's a whole lot that's wrong around the edges, but at the heart of it, they know who Jesus is. They truly believe that he's God's son, the Holy One, and so when he speaks, they listen. What else could you do uh, if you were that sure? Well, the people try and prevent Jesus from leaving, But verse 43, he said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. And so Jesus moves on with the plan of his father. He keeps trusting in the Holy Spirit's leading. The Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness. The Holy Spirit led him uh, to preach in Galilee. uh, And that's what he did. And so let's uh, conclude uh, by considering, um, are you prepared to listen to the Holy One of God? Are you prepared to be wrong, uh, to be corrected, uh, to be redirected, 
uh, by the Holy One of God? Are you prepared to be passive at times and listen and obey? But then are you also prepared to be active when he calls upon you to do what is good and right, to participate in his mission, to love his church? Uh, Being part of God's family is kind of complicated, like any family, I'm sure you're well aware. Uh, But it is a joy uh, and we have a king and saviour Uh, who has power and authority. Submit to him. Let me pray. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you that you sent your son, your holy one, to fulfill all the promises you have made, uh, to establish your church and to be our king. And so, Father, we ask, that you would help us, first of all, to recognise who Jesus is. Then, Father, we pray that you would help us to submit to him, to be obedient to him and to treat him as the Holy One. Father, we also uh, want to pray that you'd help us to know uh, when to be active, to be doing things, to be loving people, to be speaking your words, And when we just need to sit at your feet and be obedient. Father, uh, it is a joy to be part of your family. We pray that we might live as your children should. Amen.